Tolani family, my name is Tolani Abiodo, and I have the privilege of um, standing before you this morning um, to be able to preach to you from God's word. I want to say a big thank you to Dr. Andrew and Patrick Smelly for giving me this great um, honor to be able to stand before you and just share with you some convictions from God's word and from my life as well. I also want to say a big and a huge thank you to the love of my life, which is my wife, Kate. Oh, wow. I didn't know that right. But, um, you know, she does a phenomenal work of just keeping our home together, of um, being a great and effective partner in life and in ministry. Um, without her, I'll be able to do the things that I do. So I just want to say a big thank you to you, baby. Um, I love you so, so, so much. My beautiful wife and I have the privilege of living the Johannesburg Campus Ministry. You know, um, the, the young but fierce Johannesburg Campus Ministry. Let's turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 19. You know, the title of my lesson is Passing on the Dream. And it starts at the beginning of 2020. At the beginning of the year, you know, I did what I always do. I've been here for the past five years, laid out goals. Some of the goals I would like to achieve this year. And one of that goal, one of those goals, my mistake, one of those goals is to attend the Global Leadership Conference uh, that was so old in Los Angeles, California, this year. But of course, COVID-19 hit, um, embassies closed down their borders, uh, sorry, their doors, um, countries shut down their borders, and everybody was asked to stay at home. You know, I, I took some time to think about it, I was like, man, you know, maybe God was encouraging me because he knew that if that conference held and Tolani did not go, he would be mad discouraged. And a couple of months later, it was announced um, that we're going to be having a virtual World Missionary Jubilee. I was like, hey, man, for the encouragement. I was like, come on, let's do it. You know, the Jubilee was just fantastic. To see all of the work put together by our cyber ministry, um, just all the cyber evangelists and cyber women's ministry, women's ministry leader, web deacons, and, you know, interns, they did an awesome job of putting together a fantastic Jubilee. Um, it was it was great on the level of creativity, on the level of skill, and even production as well. I was just it just greatly encouraged me, particularly the singing. I loved the level of excellence that was put into the recorded sessions for the songs, and just you know how it was produced and mixed together as well. You know, I think a great source of encouragement is that those videos are online. So now, if I want to sing any songs, I want to you know just have a great time of encouragement singing in them songs. I can go to those videos online and have a great time. So I just want to say again, thank you to all of our leaders and the cyber ministry that made um, the World Mission Jubilee a huge success. You know, um, if there was any, if there was any takeaway from the lessons from the Jubilee, I mean, they were all great lessons. But for me, the great takeaway would be a combination of Kip's lesson from the Friday night's general session and um, John Cause's lesson from the men's night session. The big takeaway for me is we cannot afford to be without visions and dreams. No, it's dangerous for us not to have visions and dreams. You know, in Kip's lesson, he, he showed how God's, the state of God's people, how detestable he became, simply because their leader had lost his vision, both physically and spiritually. Excuse me. <clears throat> and also in Jacob's lesson, just seeing how the Emmaus dream to see the walls of Jerusalem rebuilt, how it inspired him and drove him to um, have a great and awesome relationship with God. And what it really shows me is that, you know, for us to be able to, allow, for God to be able to work powerfully, we need to have visions and dreams. I mean, think about it. We know men that the world knows or remembers today, um, they had dreams and visions as well. Think about Nelson Mandela, you know, and the dream he had for South Africa. Um, and even Steve Biko, with the dream have for South Africa as well, for equality in South Africa. And um, Steve Jobs, with the dream to revolutionize, revolutionize, revolutionize the tech industry and the music industry. <laughs> my mistake, oh, my apologies. And as well, um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., with his dream to see equality in America during the civil rights movement, during the era of the civil rights movement. But finally, these men, as great as their experts were, we're not disciples. So if they can have visions and dreams, then it's much more important that each of us have vision and dream as well. 
Well, you see, family, um, I decided, man, you know, coming out of the Jubilee, man, have, I decided to have a great dream for the campus ministry here in South Africa. What is my dream? Well, my dream is to see a campus ministry that consists of students from all the top universities in South Africa. I mean, needless to say, South Africa is home to the best universities on the continent of Africa, which means in South Africa we'll find the best of the best on the campuses here, the best and the brightest. But family, these students, um, they are being they're being taught to give their best to the world. We need to go on these campuses. We need to win these campus students and help them to become disciples so that they can give their best to God. That is my dream. My dream where young men and women will make the decision to take a stand against the darkness that just continues to engulf and continues to destroy the life of South African youths or youths in South Africa. To see young men and women that would rise up and just, you know, be full of light and pass on that light to generations after generations. Man, wouldn't it be just amazing to just see that happen? To see the level of sexual immorality drop, you know, uh, amongst um, 18, um, the age of eight, people in the age of 18 to 25. To see the, um, the, to see just, you know, alcoholism drop in that age group as well. Wouldn't it be just amazing to just see young men and women um, living lives that God has, has, has panned out for them. That is my dream. But I have to ask you, what is your dream? What is the dream that you're holding on and you're, you're working to pass on? You know, the reason for my lesson today is because after the Jubilee, I thought, man, what is the point of a dream if it lives and dies with you? Having a dream is awesome and it's great, but what is the goal of a dream if it lives and dies with you? You know, um, through this lesson, I'm hoping to be able to share some parts of my life. You know, to share my story. You know, how the talent that stands before you came to be the talent that stands before you today. But family, to be able to pass on the dream, what would that take? Well, I have two points for you. My first point is, to be able to pass on the dream, we have to persuade others to dream the dream. Acts 19, from verse 8 to 10. It reads, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Now, this all this stuff was going on was happening in Ephesus. Now, just some backstory for you um, about the city of Ephesus, sorry, historical lessons, if you will. The city of Ephesus was the capital of the Roman province of Asia. That was Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. Now, it was an important city because it was like a, it was a, it had, it was like a major educational center, a major commercial center, a major political center um, for the empire of Rome. Uh, simply because of where its location, it was seen as a gateway into Asia hence the name Asia Minor. Now, I believe that the, the status of this country, of the city, um, allowed, it shows that the educational centers in this city were of the topest quality, of the best quality. They were, you know, the cream of the crop, creme de la creme, if you will. <laughs> well, I was going through, during my research online, I found um, one of the sites that was excavated, believed to be the city of Ephesus. There was a, a one, of the, one of the areas excavated was a place known as the Odium. Now, there isn't enough evidence to show it, but you know, this site is believed to be one of the probable sites of the lecture hall of Tyrannus. You know, this was where back in the Bible time, this was where men would gather to discuss philosophy and religion. So it just makes sense that you know, Paul would go there and preach the word. This reminds me of my time. Um, five years ago. I was pursuing my master's degree in internet engineering at University College London, one of the best universities in the world. And while I was on campus, some students, some guys walked up to me and they asked me if I'd like to come to Bible discussion. I was like, eh, sure, no problem. I went to the discussion, they asked me if I'd like to study the Bible. I was like, sure, no problem. We sat down and we studied the Bible together. And I remember back then, man, <laughs> when we did the discipleship study, something clicked in my mind. When they showed me the scripture, 
that a disciple and the equation that a disciple is the same thing as a Christian, and a Christian is saved. That you have to be made into a disciple before you can even be called a Christian. And if you are not made into a disciple, then you're not a Christian. If you're not a Christian, you're not saved. Something clicked in my head because up until that point, all I've been doing was going for altar calls. I go for altar calls um, to give your life to Christ, altar call. We need to get your life to Christ, altar call. But there was no change in my life. Then seeing doing this Bible study, I realized. So this is why I keep going back and doing the same thing over and over again. Because I was never made into a disciple. Going out to the altar and saying a prayer is not making people into disciples. I was like, wow, that makes sense. No wonder. I've been feeling weird every time I did that. And then on the, you know, but then I remember back then during my Bible studies, I would, I would kneel down in my room and wrestle in prayer because I was like, man, these studies were piercing me. They were, they were convicting me. But I knew that the wrong choice was to run away because what this brothers were showing me was the truth. And so what happened, 15th of March, 2015, you know, I made Jesus Lord of my life. It was, woo, it was awesome. But then I remember, this, I remember those days, man. I was just fired up to be a disciple. I, was, I remember going with my disciple, and he would train me and teach me how to share my faith. Um, his name was um, Yuri Zikov. He's a Russian-German. Um, he would teach me how to share my faith. There was a day when I was challenged to share with 100 people in a day. Woo! It was... But to God be the glory, I shared with 103 people. Amen. <laughs> well, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a great challenge to be able to get me out of myself. But I remember those days, you know, through God's God working, I was able to meet a British American by the name of Kobe Gray. And Kobe um, became a disciple in July of 2015, four months after my baptism. Um, Kobe now leads the London campus ministry with his wife, Rebecca. Please pray for them as they would also be leading the mission team to plant a church in Edinburgh, Scotland next year. You see, family... As disciples were persuaded from the scriptures that we need to follow Jesus and also lead others to follow Jesus as well. But persuasion comes at a price. Persuasion comes at a price. If we're gonna go, if we're gonna be effective at persuading the hearts of others, then we need um, to embrace my second point, which is we need to be pierced to achieve the dream. If we're going to go out and persuade others to dream the dream, then we need to be willing to be pierced to achieve the dream. Acts 16 verse 1 to 5, where my second point comes from, and it reads, Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. You know, I can relate to Timothy in a way. Why? Because my mom, in the eyes of the world, will be, will be, um, will be seen as a believer. She was the one that you know, really raised myself and my siblings to you know, believe in the Bible and to hold to what the Bible says. But she's not a disciple. So that's why I said in the eyes of the world, she'll be seen as a believer. And my dad will be seen as some sort of a Greek. Why? Because he's Muslim. <laughs> now, I remember after moving from London to Lagos um, to wait for the Lagos mission team in 2016. In April of 2016, Dr. Andrew Smelly visited um, Lagos and he asked for us to meet. So I met with him and we discussed. He wanted to ascertain, during our meeting, he wanted to ascertain if I'll be an active member of the, you know, Lagos Mission team. And, you know, that really wasn't my dream at that point in time. You know, my dream was to, you know, have a great job, you know, make, like, some money, become successful, you know, even start my own business, that I'll have to make some money. Then I'll, you know, make that money and use it to advance, you know, God's kingdom. Um, because I was like, man, you know, you already have enough hands on the mission team. You know, you already have people that are more talented than I am. You know, I can go into the world and make money and use that money to be able to advance God's kingdom. And I once said, you know, maybe when the time comes to go into the ministry, I would, um, I can become, with the money I would make, I can become a self-supporting missionary. 
Well, we talk about self deceit, right? <laughs> well, um, as it would happen, in the months that followed that, I fell into gross sexual impurity with women from the world. Um, I saw the devil take out two members, two essential members of the mission team um, as they fell to sexual sin and pride. And all of this situation that was going on, for me, it felt like, you know, my own spiritual circumcision. It felt like the circumcision I had to go through uh, to be able to be prepared to go along with Andrew and do what God wanted me to do. Because after all these events, I realized what God was calling me to do. After fasting and praying about it for some months, I decided to go into the full-time ministry. So, in um, May 2018, I resigned from my job as a senior IT infrastructure executive um, with an environmental firm I was working with, with an with a environmental management firm I was working with. I resigned, went into full-time ministry, and um, God gave me the opportunity to lead you know, the mighty and fearless Lagos campus ministry. And it was the, one of the most rewarding decisions I've ever had to make in my life. Because during our time there, we saw God grew the ministry from 14 campus disciples to 31 campus disciples in three months. We had our very first inaugural campus Sunday service, where we saw campus students conduct the service from the beginning all the way to the end. We saw um, over 160 people in attendance at that service which was about the second highest attendance in the Lagos church at that time. You know, it was just God working through each and every single one of these disciples. But for me, at that point, I realized, man, I realized that that dream would have come true if I was willing to pierce my dream. That dream was God's dream getting fulfilled, but it wouldn't have come true if I wasn't willing to pierce my own dream. My question for you is, are you willing to do the same? You know, um, I think about one of the times that really encouraged me during my time in the Lagos campus ministry was when the, the union of um, university staff, that's a, they went on a nationwide strike for four months and the campus disciples all had to return home. And many of them lived ridiculously far from where the church meets. So we decided that we're going to go visit them. I went to visit them. Because one of my convictions is, you know, if, you, if you're going to call people to go along with you, they have to be willing to share in your troubles. So I went to visit them. And through these visits, I really saw the heart of the, camp, of the Lagos campus disciples. Because the places where they were traveling from and the state of the roads in those places, the roads in South Africa are good. The state of those roads in those places, my goodness. But this, this campus disciples would travel from there to church and back every week to be at the meetings of the body. I was like, man, I got so convicted. You know, it reminds me of, you know, uh, my brother like Sheya Kanjai, who went through intense persecu persecution from his dad. Um, his dad threatened him, beat him up for coming out to church. But she stood faithful, took a stand. He stood faithful as a disciple. And she now is doing amazing. He leads the ushery team for the Lagos church. You know, but finally, if God could do this in Lagos, Nigeria, then what can he do on the campuses here in South Africa, on the campus here in Johannesburg? You know, right now, like I said, we're a young but fierce campus ministry. Right now, we're just five campus disciples. But I long for the day when that five will become 20. When that 20 will become 50, when 50 will become 100, because out of this ministry, we're going to see young men and women raise up and lead uh, mission teams, lead church plantings to every major city in South Africa and to every country uh, across Southern Africa as well. Because truly, um, we need to send out, we need to show, we need to give God our best. We need to give God our best, not giving our world, not giving our best to the world, but giving God our very, very, very best. This is what God's plan for South Africa is. To be able to allow His light shine through the life of the people here, through the lives of the people here. But first, we have to make sure that um, we have a campus ministry that reflects God's glory. Family, in closing here, I'm going to read the scripture in 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 4 to 6. It says, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you 
Because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. You know, this is a scripture that I sometimes wrestle with. So I mean, God really choose me. But you know what encourages me? I'm mean, thinking about times when the disciples would come up to me and you know they would thank me for either a talk we had or even studying the Bible with them to say, become disciples. I was like, man, who am I? I mean, it's just lowly me. I, I'm, just, I'm just grateful to be a disciple and I want to be able to pass on that to others as well. That, that has always been my heart. And you know, but it, it warms my heart when things like that happen. I remember a brother in London had walked up to me in 2017 when I visited. And this brother reminded me of a talk we had back in 2016 before I left London. And he said, man, do you remember that time at your brother's house when we had that talk? I was like, yeah, I do. And I was like, you know, I want to thank you for that talk, man. Because that talk saved my life. You know, um, man, that moved my heart. And I was like, wow. Amen. Amen. Uh, the brother leads the, team, the teens ministry in the London church with his girlfriend. Wow. I was like, you know, God works in great ways. But, you know, reflecting on moments like this help me really appreciate the dream. But appreciating the dream also means passing on that dream so that the dream lives on, so that it lives long before us. But family, that's what we need to do. Family, that's what we need to set our minds and our hearts to. It's time for us to set the campuses of South Africa on fire for God, one soul at a time. We need to dream for our campuses, we need to act on those dreams, and we need to pass on those dreams. And to God be the glory.